Thank you, Mike. That's, sure. um, I will first allow my president, the president of the Cornell Policy Review, uh, Tiffany Agard, has a few words to make uh, for the commencement of this event, particularly because it's the median edition of the speaker series. And uh, we couldn't have had a better um, speaker to preface the uh, long series of speakerships we will uh, be doing under the auspices of Cornell Policy Review. So, Tiffany, please. Thank you, Cosmos. I'm really excited that you guys are all here today. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your afternoon to spend with us. As Cosmos mentioned, um, this is sort of the first edition of the Cornell Policy Review Speaker Series. And for those who don't know, my name is Tiffany Agard and I have the pleasure of being the editor in chief of the Policy Review this year. So generally the Cornell Policy Review publishes well-researched and objective essays about different areas of public policy. And what we wanna do with this speaker series is sort of take that a step further and provide an opportunity for discussion and dialogue around different questions of public policy. And so today's dialogue, as Professor Dorf mentioned, will be around the process of um, the appointment of justices to the Supreme Court of the United States. So we're really excited to be able to tackle this timely um, topic during an election year, during um, you know, a vacancy in the Supreme Court um, due to the recent passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's also a fellow you know, Cornell alum. Mm -hmm. um, and then just sort of a quick note before I turn it over to Cosmos to introduce um, Professor Dorf. We just wanna let everyone know that we'll be recording this dialogue and that there will be a Q and A session. I, I guess maybe a bit at the end, I know Cosmos has a couple of questions um, but you know, we can also make this a very fluid discussion. So feel free to just sort of engage as you'd like. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Cosmos Enzium, who is a member of our senior editorial board. He is a lawyer by trade, uh, has been a lecturer at the law school here at Cornell and is uh, an esteemed policy and law enthusiast. So we're very excited to have him on our board and to have him moderating this conversation today with Professor Dorf. So, Cosmos, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I, I am excited to be part of the Connect Policy Review. And I do not think um, deliberations can ever be too much because dialogue is the stuff of democracies. And it is emphatically the province or the duty of the Department of Judiciary to determine what the law is. And so we are excited to commence and our speaker is no less a scholar, but Professor Michael Dove, a distinguished constitutional law scholar, but his constitutional law scholarship also intersects clearly with public policy. And so be ready to ask a number, number of questions. And he has suggested that you can in, in, come in at any point in time with questions you have so that we can have this dialogue. So Professor Duff has authored more than 100 scholarly papers. He also clerked at the Supreme Court of the United States in his early days in the career. And he's currently working with an interdisciplinary team here at Cornell trying to fashion out policies affecting uh, different advertisements of tobacco, particularly the new trends of tobacco advertisements within the country. Professor Duff, you are on the platform, please. Uh, thank you very much, Cosmos, and thank you, uh, uh, Tiffany. So first of all, a couple of things for those of you who joined uh, uh, in the last minute or so. Um, first, uh, as Cosmos said, I'm happy to take questions as we go. And given that we're a relatively small group, you can just feel free to interrupt me. Apparently, that's how things work now. Um, and uh, although I'm, I'm expecting that your interruptions will be much more uh, welcome and polite. Um, the, the second thing is, uh, please call me Mike. Um, I, you know, it's an informal setting and so I'm happy to do that. Okay, uh, so what I'd like to do is I'll talk a little bit about the uh, uh, judicial appointments in the US as a general matter, a little bit about how we got to where we are now um, with respect to the current vacancy and nomination a little bit what I about what I think the right uh, tactic ought to be for uh, the Democrats. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll say that mostly because that's the people, those are the people I 
I'm most closely affiliated with and that I talk to. Um, and, and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, proposals uh, going forward, such as court packing and so forth. But as, again, as I said, feel free to interrupt me uh, at, at any point. Uh, so uh, the U.S. has a, um, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, judiciary is divided between state courts and federal courts. And according to the Constitution of the United States, the federal courts are to consist of a Supreme Court uh, and such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. That's the language I'm paraphrasing, but that's more or less exactly it. Um, what's interesting about that constitutional language is uh, two things. So one is, uh, although it establishes that there shall be a Supreme Court, it doesn't, set, doesn't say anything about how many people are going to be on the court. Uh, it does say that all federal judges uh, serve during what it calls good behavior, uh, which has been taken to be a term of art for essentially uh, life tenure absent some kind of impeachable offense, uh, and can't have their salaries reduced while in office. So that's sort of the, the first point is that the, uh, there has to be a Supreme Court. We don't know how big it is, what its structure is, et cetera. The second thing that's interesting is that the creation and staffing of the lower federal courts is left entirely to the discretion of Congress. Now, uh, from the very earliest days of the uh, US Republic, Congress has created and established uh, lower federal courts but their jurisdiction has changed and evolved over time. So it started out relatively narrow. It grew, but it's still not uh, gigantic. Uh, and it's still the case that the vast majority of cases in the United States are heard in state courts. And that includes the vast majority of cases that raise federal issues, because by far the most common kind of federal issue arises by way of a defense presented by a criminal defendant in a state court prosecution. Um, and those cases start out in state court and nearly all of them end in state court. So if we think about adjudication in the United States, it is primarily uh, occurring in state courts. Um, but the Supreme Court be has the power of uh, judicial review and statutory interpretation with respect to federal statutes. And so some of the most contentious issues invariably end up uh, in the US Supreme Court. Not all of them, there are all sorts of questions that are not resolved by the judiciary, but many contentious issues and uh, you know, ones just so including the validity of uh, healthcare legislation, uh, social issues like uh, abortion, gun control, death penalty, et cetera. And so obviously the stakes are very high. Okay, that's the sort of uh, constitutional background. It's notable on the point, about, the point about life tenure is that this makes the United States a virtually complete outlier in the world of constitutional democracies. Um, every other constitutional democracy of which I'm aware has an apex court on which uh, judges or justices serve for fixed terms. Uh, typically something between 10 and 18 years, depending on the country. Uh, but no other country that I know of has uh, the, the combination that we have of uh, justices who serve for life um, and have the power of judicial review and uh, operate in a system in which the constitution is extremely difficult to amend. So this gives our justices enormous power. And as a consequence, it makes the stakes of Supreme Court nominations to, to a lesser degree, but not in significant degree, lower court nominations uh, and confirmations uh, extremely important, right? Because it is, the, it is the opportunity to give somebody essentially unreviewable power for something on the order of four decades, depending on their lifespan and so forth. Um, all right, so that's, that's the background. Uh, for much of US history, the Supreme Court has been ideologically divided. Uh, this was true very early on in the United States, uh, basically beginning in, um, I think it's fair to say 1796. That is to say after, so, so George Washington is the first president, he serves two terms. Uh, after that, Adam, John Adams heads what is known as the Federalist Party, 
Thomas Jefferson heads the rival party, and they they have they conflict on all sorts of issues, including the judiciary. And the Adams uh, judiciary, the Federalist judges, are openly hostile to Jefferson and his allies. Uh, and that results in a contest over the court. It's, it results in an attempted impeachment of uh, some justices. It, it's the conflict, it's that conflict that gives rise to the decision in Marbury against Madison that establishes the power of the Supreme Court uh, of judicial review. Uh, and so very, very early on, uh, the court is sort of embroiled in political contestation. Uh, the Federalists win that contest for roughly the first third of the 19th century. Uh, and so uh, if you just read the Supreme Court cases, it looks like a period of quiet, but it isn't really. There continues to be political contestation. It's just that one party uh, is fairly dominant. And the differences in politics erupt again on the Supreme Court in the battle over slavery and leading up to and following the Civil War. And following the Civil War, it's so contentious that Congress at one point uh, reduces the size of the Supreme Court in order to deny to their rival the opportunity to name a justice and then increases the size and it goes up and down, right? So, so that, that's the sort of 19th century. And that, that doesn't end in the 20th century. In the early 20th century, progressives are extremely critical of the US Supreme Court because the court uses uh, the due process and equal protection clauses of the, fifth and, uh, of the 14th Amendment, the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment to strike down legislation, narrowly construes congressional power uh, in the service of laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, and so progressives are, are hostile to judicial review in this period. And that spills over into battles over appointments as well, culminating in uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, court packing plan to which I'll return uh, a little bit later. All right, so the idea that uh, Supreme Court nominations are politically contentious is nothing new uh, in American politics. It's been with us for quite some time. The modern era, uh, is typically traced back to the 1987 nomination by President Reagan of Robert Bork to the uh, seat that was opened up when Justice Lewis Powell retired. I I'm not sure that's necessarily the right place to start, but if you look at that, that's when you have contentious hearings in the modern era, although even after that, uh, there were non-contentious hearings. So, and uh, after that, and around the same time. So, uh, Reagan nominated Justice Scalia uh, just a year before he nominated Bork, and the Bork was rejected, but Scalia was confirmed virtually unanimously. Later, President Clinton's uh, uh, nominees, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Stephen Breyer, are confirmed virtually unanimously. Uh, but you begin then to see the uh, you, you see some of the erosion of that of that uh, more recently. Basically, what's happened is uh, political polarization has spilled over into the judiciary. So one way to understand why there was a period of non uh, of less contentious Supreme Court nominations up until sort of the early to mid '80s is that there were the the two parties were less ideologically coherent and less ideologically distant from one another during that period. And so it was much easier to find consensus nominees. That's why some of the people that we think of as the most liberal justices in the modern court's history, uh, Earl Warren, uh, William Brennan, um, uh, Harry Blackman, uh, to some extent, David Souter, John Paul Stevens, these are all Republican appointees who ended up being on the sort of liberal wing of the court in the case of Warren and Brennan leading the liberal wing of the court. Uh, and the reason for that is that the Republican party and the Democratic party during the 1940s through the early 80s are ideologically mixed. So there are liberal Republicans who are to the left of conservative Democrats, uh, and therefore there's room for broad consensus nominees. 
Once that stops being true, uh, and we revert more to the pattern that you saw in earlier periods in American history, when the parties were more ideologically coherent, it's not surprising that Supreme Court nominations and judicial nominations more broadly become more contentious. And that brings us to the, the sort of contemporary moment. So you'll recall that in 2016, uh, in February, Justice Scalia died. Uh, and uh, after a period of mourning, uh, President Obama nominated uh, Merrick Garland, who is the chief judge of the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit. And I would say a sort of center left uh, uh, figure, um, sort of moderate to liberal. <coughs> uh, Obama deliberately chooses a moderate to liberal as opposed to a clearly liberal candidate because he's hoping that the Senate, which is uh, majority Republican, will go along with the nomination. But Mitch McConnell, then as now the uh, Senate majority leader, says uh, essentially, no, I'm not going to schedule any hearings uh, because, and he gives the reason, the American people should decide who uh, the next justice is, and they'll do it in the next presidential election, and the winner of that will win uh, uh, confirmation. Um, this was, at the time, widely believed to be a you know nonsensical explanation, right? Uh, there was always some election coming up. There was plenty of time from February before November, uh, even before October, to to vet an, a new uh, nominee, but. Uh, what I think most people understood McConnell really to be saying was Supreme Court nominations are now contentious. We, the Republicans, are going to exercise party discipline in the Senate, and we're not going to confirm your, your candidates. Too bad. Uh, and of course, as we now know, that was in fact what he was saying, uh, because uh, now Justice Ginsburg, having died much, much closer to the presidential election, all of a sudden it's perfectly permissible to confirm uh, a nominee. Now, what the Republicans have tried to say to uh, reconcile these uh, contradictory positions is, well, uh, in 2016, uh, the president was of a different party from the Senate. Well, that's true. That explains why you have the power to do this, but it's not an actual justification, right? It's an explanation, but it's not a justification. If the justification then was the American people can only have their say through an election. Well, that's even more so true now, given that we're closer to the election. But nonetheless, right, there is, uh, there is power to do that, right? And so that's, what, that's where we are now. And so the president has nominated uh, uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett, whom he previously had put on uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. And uh, so to my mind, there are now sort of two sorts of immediate questions for uh, Senate Democrats. There aren't really any questions for Senate Republicans because they want to they clearly want to confirm her with the uh, exception of the um, uh, Sen one senator uh, from Maine who's in a tough reelection battle and a senator from Alaska. So it's a senator, uh, uh, Senator uh, so, sorry, so, so they're, they, they've announced that, they, that they're uh, opposed not to the particular nominee, but to the idea that the president gets to choose uh, before the intervening election. Okay, um, so that brings us to what the Democrats ought to do. I put on my blog yesterday a suggestion that the best strategy for the Democrats is simply not to engage, right? To effectively either boycott the hearings entirely, or if they are incapable of doing that because they're senators and so they like to be on TV, uh, to use their time to make affirmative speeches, to predict terrible things the court will do uh, on the Affordable Care Act and otherwise, uh, to decry and criticize their Republican colleagues for hypocrisy, but not to substantively engage. Because the pattern we've seen in these hearings is, with the exception of the two sort of one-off uh, events uh, where the hearings be, uh, delved into sort of personal moral character and fitness, in the case of uh, Clarence Thomas in 1991 and Brett Kavanaugh a couple of years ago, with those exceptions, right, when the uh, questioning focuses on substance, whether it's a Republican senator questioning a Democratic nominee or a Democratic senator questioning 
a Republican nominee, uh, the nominees just know much more and are much better positioned than the senators are. Some of the senators are pretty good. I mean, some of them are lawyers, right? You know, uh, Kamala Harris is a former prosecutor. She's very good at that. Al Franken was very good at this uh, before he left left the Senate. Um, you know, Sheldon Whitehouse, former prosecutor, also they're they're you know they're not bad. They're good lawyers, but the the way the thing is structured is. You know, the the nominee has all the cards because the nominee can always refuse to answer a question uh, by saying that, well, the, the way that uh, Justice Kagan, when, a, when she was a law professor, described it, they engage in a two step. If the question is about a particular case, they say, I can't answer that because the issue might come before me. And if it's a general question, they say, well, I don't want to deal with a hypothetical because that's not how a judge considers these questions. And so you avoid anything you, you want to avoid. Uh, and so the, uh, it, it, it's virtually impossible to, you know, to, for a senator to win one of those uh, exchanges. And you know, Judge Coney Barrett is uh, certainly smart. Uh, she's thought about these issues. She will. She'll. She'll know when to duck questions, and therefore there's there's nothing to be gained from questioning her. So that's my analysis. Whether it'll work or not, I don't know. Um, you know, if if and, and I don't know whether whether they'll they'll try it. And, and what what I, what I mean by work is not in the sense the sense that it'll prevent the confirmation. I assume that. Uh, Judge Barrett will be confirmed uh, by a, an extremely narrow margin, uh, and that'll be that. Um, okay, one more thing I want to say about all of this before I turn to the final topic, which is, you know, what's the next move, uh, which is that the uh, one little piece of the recent history I omitted was the two-step abolition of the filibuster for judicial nominations. So uh, under the, uh, the Constitution, in order for a judicial nominee to be confirmed to her or his uh, seat on the court, uh, it requires a simple majority vote. The uh, Constitution says that the president shall uh, nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate, and that's the default there is a simple majority. But uh, since at some point in the mid to late 19th century, the Senate has operated under various uh, rules, uh, sometimes called the cloture rule, about what it takes to end a debate on an issue, including judicial nominations. And it's fluctuated over time, but for a, a while, uh, it had stabilized at 60 votes. That the rule said you need 60 votes uh, to end debate on a matter on the floor of the Senate. During the Obama presidency, the uh, uh, majority leader for a time, Senator Harry Reid, a Democrat, uh, became increasingly frustrated with increasing use of the filibuster by Republicans to block all sorts of matters. And so the, under, under uh, Reid, the Democrats got rid of the filibuster for executive branch appointments and lower court judicial nominees. Now, how did they do it? They did it through a maneuver that's called the nuclear option, which means they didn't formally change the rules. They just argued, they just voted that the rules were out of order, uh, but it, they effectively changed the rules. Um, when the Republicans took the Senate and uh, Trump became president, they responded in kind when it appeared that they weren't going to get 60 votes for their first uh, Supreme Court nominee, uh, just, now Justice Neil Gorsuch. And so the, they got rid of the filibuster for that as well. The cloture rule, like the, the threshold of 60 votes, remains the rule for ordinary legislation to pass in the Senate. But there's a broad, a broad expectation that it, it'll eventually go by the wayside as well. Uh, but that's not going to directly affect this, except with respect to something I'm about to, to discuss. Okay, so uh, let's imagine now that at some point, uh, perhaps uh, in the next few months, Democrats retake both houses of Congress uh, and the presidency, and the current president actually leaves office without igniting a civil war. Um, the uh, at that point, what uh, what might they do? 
uh, to respond, right? So the normally, you, you know, you, if you your side doesn't have a majority in the Supreme Court, you know, you just sort of wait it out uh, or you try to amend the Constitution. Uh, but there is a widespread feeling among Democrats that the advantage that the Republicans have now is fundamentally unfair in basically two respects. One respect is the obvious one, right, which was that, well, the uh, Republicans oughtn't to have had the Gorsuch seat uh, plus the, what will become the Barrett seat, right? That, you know, may, if, if they were justified in uh, withholding consent uh, to the, in 2016, then they're unjustified now uh, and vice versa, right? So at the very least, that's a seat that it, one of those seats has to be deemed stolen. And to make up for it, it's not enough to add one seat to the Supreme Court, you'd have to add two to cancel it out. So one popular view is that the Democrats ought to add two seats to the Supreme Court. Uh, that would still leave uh, a Republican majority, it'd be six to five. Uh, one of those people is Chief Justice John Roberts, who is sort of drifted from uh, the court's right to what you might call the center right. Uh, and so you might say, well, still, it's, that's, the, that's the appropriate tit for tat uh, response. Uh, I have seen suggestions of adding more than two seats. Uh, and that would have to be justified by some other theory. One would simply be, well, it's naked power politics. A different theory might be that uh, the Constitution at, at the moment, uh, as it always has, is somewhat profoundly unrepresentative, right? So that through the Senate uh, and the Electoral College, it overrepresents um, large, relatively unpopulous, uh, disproportionately rural states, which are disproportionately likely to vote for Republicans. And that has allowed Republicans to name a majority of justices, even though over the course of the last 30 years or so, more people have on average voted for Democrats, both for Congress and the president. Uh, and so the idea here would be this is a way to sort of balance that out. Um, the problem as I see it with court packing is that it has, you know, no logical stopping point, right? That is to say, if the, that, that is, you know, the distinctions that the Democrats are going to draw that justify them in court packing will be rejected by Republicans so that if and when the Republicans regain control over both houses of Congress and the presidency, they'll pack the court with even more and you have a, a kind of escalation game. Uh, and therefore, uh, it strikes me that although court packing might be tried, um, it's not a long term solution to the infection of the Supreme Court uh, with partisanship. Are there alternatives? Yeah, there are a few. So one possibility uh, that I've heard discussed somewhat that I, I've talked about not in a political context, but in the sort of scholarly context in some of my work is what's known as jurisdiction stripping. So the US Constitution establishes the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court uh, with respect to uh, the most important piece is uh, that it can hear cases arising under the Constitution, laws, and treaties of the United States. But it also says that this jurisdiction is subject to such exceptions and regulations as Congress may make. And so uh, there have at various points in US history been efforts by Congress to rein in the Supreme Court by restricting its jurisdiction over particular subject matters. So one thing you might see, you know, you could imagine the Congress uh, restricting the court's ability to uh, hear a case presenting a question of the constitutionality of some federal statute, like the Affordable Care Act or something like that. Who knows? Right. So that's that's another possibility. Uh, a third uh, possibility and one that I and, and a lot of law professors tend to favor as likely to be the most the, the, uh, the, the sort of most de-escalatory uh, is actually to impose term limits on Supreme Court justices. 
Uh, the most popular figure out there is 18 years. The virtue of 18 years is it allows you to have a uh, nine justice court in which each justice serves for 18 years and, a, and there would be a new appointee every two years once you had established a sort of ongoing uh, system of rotation. If a justice were to retire or die in office prior to the, the end of their 18 year term, then you would have a procedure for filling that seat, but it would only be for the duration of the 18 year term. Uh, this, as I say, this, this proposal, it's not my proposal, it's originally, it was originally proposed uh, by Paul Carrington um, and Roger Crampton. Uh, Crampton is the what was, was, he's no longer alive, but he was a uh, law professor at Cornell and the dean of the Cornell Law School for some years. Uh, Carrington is a professor at Duke. Uh, and they proposed this uh, about 15 years ago. Um, and the, the question, and, and, I, and as I say, it's been uh, generally received very positively by uh, scholars. Um, there is a question of what, whether it would require a constitutional amendment however, because right, it's the Constitution that says that uh, the uh, members of the federal judiciary serve during good behavior, meaning uh, life tenure. And so how could you change that without a constitutional amendment? Uh, one argument I've heard, which I think is not a bad argument, although it's not exactly a slam dunk, one argument is that this would be consistent with the Constitution because after the 18 year term, a justice would not lose their judicial commission, they would simply rotate down to a federal appeals court. So uh, you would continue to be a judge in the Article III judiciary. Uh, you would just serve on a different court. And the argument here is that, well, during earlier periods, uh, and even today, judges and justices have been able to serve by assignment on different courts. You, you know, the important thing is that you're an Article III judge or justice, not what your particular position is. Uh, I'm a little skeptical that that would be uh, accepted by the courts, right? There's a, there's a sort of self-interest issue uh, here about who gets to rule on this. Probably they themselves would. Uh, but the argument against it, I think, is that we've long understood that, at least with respect to the Supreme Court, uh, the fact that you're a member of the, the judiciary already doesn't mean that you're a Supreme Court justice, right? That is, it does appear to be a kind of distinctive position, and the commissions have long treated it that way. Does it, not a slam dunk the other way, uh, but, the, but that's a possibility. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think my view is that the, you know, if I were, if I were, uh, if I'm asked, and I, maybe I'll just push this out there when, I, before I'm asked, uh, the, the way I would write the, the bill that creates uh, the 18 uh, year term limits is I, I would write it uh, contingently. So it would establish 18 year term limits, um, but it would have a fallback provision. Um, and the fallback provision would say that if this uh, uh, law is held unconstitutional, there shall be created four additional seats on the Supreme Court, All right? Now, is that valid? Well, I wrote an article in the Columbia Law Review in 2006 on fallback provisions, uh, in which I argued that as a general matter, fallback provisions are, are permissible, except where they are coercive. Uh, if I'm right, does this law satisfy my criterion? I'm not sure. It's sort of intended to be coercive, but not entirely, right? That is the idea here is that there's a problem with the Supreme Court is currently structured. The best solution is term limits. If the court's unwilling to accept that, well, then the second best solution is court packing. Uh, it has the sort of beneficial side effect of uh, leading the justice, of sort of putting a gun to the heads of the justices saying, hey, if you don't want court packing, uh, you'll accept the constitutionality of these 18 year term limits. So I'll probably write that up at some point uh, if uh, there is a democratic president and democratic Congress. Okay, uh, happy to uh, talk further, answer questions or open the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dove for that uh, insightful uh, 
overview of the process of judicial appointment and what it looks like within the United States vis-a-vis -vis all the politics. I do have some questions to ask, but I, I would let uh, our participants uh, go first. Uh, I mean, like Professor Dove is ready to uh, take any of the questions. You don't have to raise your hand. You can just jump on it. So go for it. If possible, I would like to ask a question first. I'm really curious sort of the way that the founding fathers first created the Supreme Court. It ultimately was created in my um, interpretation that they're completely not political. They're completely separated from the public. It's like they're not influenced by politics. And they try to separate them from politics as much as possible as sort of that they're more technocrats. They're really good at interpreting the constitution, not that they're interpreting the constitution for some purpose, which is now sort of what we've led into right now. So is it that that founding fathers assumption, at least how I interpret it, is that the Supreme Courts will be able to keep that separation completely from public opinion, from political opinion, is like we can't even consider that right now with the way that um, American politics are running right now. Yeah, so let me say two things about that. First, I think the framers were not naive about the law. There's a, there, uh, there is a view that we teach in American law schools uh, that I think is fundamentally erroneous. It's a view that says that prior to roughly 1880 or so, um, people in uh, the Anglo-American world were naive formalists who believed that law uh, was a very determinate uh, subject that was independent of politics. And it's only with the uh, emergence of legal realism, beginning with sort of proto-legal realists like Oliver Wendell Holmes, that people come to understand the importance of values and policy in the application of law. Uh, the truth, I think, is that uh, at least at the time of the founding, the uh, sophisticated thinkers understood that law and uh, that that law does not exist separate from politics and values, um, and you can see that in uh, two places. That I'll, I'll you can see it in many places, but I'll highlight two. So one is a very famous exchange of letters between James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. So Madison is at the Constitutional Convention and it's his draft uh, presented by his Virginia colleague, Edmund Randolph, but really his, his handiwork that forms the kind of backbone for what becomes the Constitution somewhat in uh, combination with the, the so-called New Jersey plan. Uh, but mostly it's Madison's handiwork. Jefferson is at the time the US ambassador to France. He's in Paris. And so he's only hearing about this, you know, via late 18th century modes of communication, meaning uh, weeks later. Uh, but they exchange letters. And uh, when Jefferson sees the, the end product, he writes to Madison, and he's very unhappy about the fact that the Constitution, as originally proposed, does not contain a Bill of Rights. Now, it has some rights. Uh, Article 1, 1, Sections 9 and 10 have some rights, but it doesn't have a comprehensive Bill of Rights. Uh, and Jefferson and Madison then exchanged letters in which the point of contention is really about, well, can we specify rights in a way that will be sufficiently protective and also constraining on the judiciary. And it is to a modern reader's eye, extremely contemporary. They are making arguments that legal realists in the 20th century, critical legal scholars today could have made, okay? You see the same thing in a late 18th century case, uh, Calder against Bull, in an exchange of concurring 
opinions uh, between Justice Chase and Justice Iredell, in which they're arguing over the enforceability of natural law. Uh, and Iredell, whose view becomes the orthodox one, uh, basically says, look, nobody can tell exactly what this is. There are different people hold different views. And so we shouldn't be enforcing this because people are going to, to, to disagree. Um, so that's the first point, which is that I think the framing generation understood that law is not separate from politics. The second point is that to the extent that they nonetheless expected judges to try to keep their political druthers out of judging, uh, they were naive, but not about judges. They were naive, or I think maybe a more charitable way to put it is couldn't foresee how the system they created would work. Um, and what they didn't foresee was the crucial role that political parties would come to play in American politics uh, and that they would do so, so quickly, right? So yeah, I mean, when I was talking earlier about polarization moving from the political system to the judicial system, that happens almost immediately. Right. As soon as there are Federalists and Democratic Republicans, which was the name of Jefferson's party, there are Federalist judges and Democratic Republican judges, and they have different views about how to go about construing the law. So I, I guess I think that, you know, there is this, this ideal of the impersonality and neutrality and the formality of law. And to some extent, I think everybody shares a version of it, right? We don't want judges simply to be engaging in partisan politics, but uh, the extent to which we have sort of fallen away from it, uh, I, I think has not varied that much over the course of US history. It's gone up and down, but it's not like there has been a sea change in my view. Thank you. Sure. I'm sure we can take another question. We still have time. Yeah. Sure. So maybe while we wait for the other questions to come up, I was gonna, I was wondering if you could speak a little more about the policy implications of some of the recent decisions. You find that uh, a number of um, serious, or will I say difficult deliberations within the policy spaces end up at the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court has become the default uh, platform upon which these debates end. I would wonder whether you have any particular modern cases you might draw attention to, particularly drawing attention to the policy implications as opposed to just the jurisprudence. Sure. So let me start with saying exactly what I just said, which is that this is, this is also a very old phenomenon. And by this, I mean the resolution of fundamental policy questions in our Supreme Court. So here again, two examples from the 19th century, right? One is uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, tours the United States in the 1830s, uh, writes a very uh, influential book, Democracy in America, in which uh, he says, among many other things, uh, in America, every policy question eventually becomes a legal question for resolution by the courts, right? So this is, this is in the relatively early Republic. So this is an old phenomenon. All right. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the Affordable Care Act, because I think that's the, the uh, at the moment, an enormous uh, policy question. I, maybe if there's time, I can talk a little bit about some of the um, uh, pandemic response, which which could Im could could end up in the in the courts and already has to some degree. Um, so, right again, the, so just as the U.S. is an outlier with respect to our uh, court uh, uh, appointment and tenure process, uh, we are an outlier with respect to the uh, to uh, healthcare. Uh, every other. Um, uh, sort of technologically advanced country in the world and many technologically not that advanced countries in the world 
uh, have as a basic human right uh, health care. Uh, not so the United States. The United States has a fragmented system in which a great many people get health care through their employers. People who are over the age of 65 uh, get government, uh, federal government provided health care called Medicare. Uh, people who ser have served in the military uh, have the possibility of uh, uh, Veterans Administration health care. Uh, people who fall below the poverty line are eligible for Medicaid, which is a chronically underfunded, federally funded, but state administered program. Uh, and then in 2010, Congress passed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, which did two main things. One was to expand eligibility for Medicaid a little bit upwards, but the Supreme Court said that the expansion insofar as it leveraged existing federal funding was unconstitutional and so gave states the option of expanding or not. And so some very populous states like Texas did not expand Medicaid and therefore there are you know, millions of people lacking uh, health insurance who, who would qualify in states that did expand Medicaid. And then for people who are not uh, so poor as to be eligible for Medicaid, not old enough to be eligible for Medicare, and don't have employer uh, supplied health insurance, the Affordable Care Act created uh, the so-called exchanges, right, on which people can purchase uh, private health insurance and included this provision, which was very controversial, the so-called individual mandate, uh, which says that uh, people who fall within the relevant group have to purchase the health insurance, uh, and then provides most of them, but not all of them, with a subsidy to purchase such health insurance and has various other regulations. Uh, this was controversial because this is a fundamentally libertarian country, um, and so many people objected that they shouldn't be for forced to purchase health insurance. The policy rationale for the individual mandate was a collective action problem right, which is one of the features of the Affordable Care Act was to make illegal what had been a very widespread practice of insurance companies of not insuring people with serious pre-existing medical conditions, right? If you're, if you're a private insurer and your goal is to make money selling health insurance, then what you want to do is you want to maximize your premiums and minimize what you have to pay out uh, in healthcare costs. And the way you do that is by trying to ensure as many healthy people as possible who are not going to necessitate uh, uh, large payouts. Now, that makes sense from the economic standpoint of the private insurance companies. Doesn't make a lot of sense from the humanitarian standpoint of trying to uh, ensure public health. Uh, and so what the Affordable Care Act did was to say, you can't do that, insurance companies. You, have to, you, you can't deny somebody coverage because they have a pre-existing condition. But once the law said that, it had to also deal with the sort of moral hazard that it created. Because a person who is otherwise in good health uh, might say to themselves, well, I'm not going to pay several hundred dollars a month for this health insurance policy uh, because I don't need health care. Uh, if I get sick, well, then this new law says at that point they have to cover me. Then I'll go to the insurance company. The fact that I'm sick won't preclude my getting health insurance because they can't screen me out for having a pre-existing condition. And so to address that problem, the worry of what's sometimes called moral hazard, the original Affordable Care Act included the individual mandate. The individual mandate was challenged in court uh, on the ground that it was beyond the power of Congress. It was not challenged on libertarian grounds. That is to say, it, it, was, it was not claimed, or at least by the time the case got the, to the Supreme Court, the claim wasn't being made that the law was unconstitutional because it invaded individual freedom. Rather, the claim was that this was the power that the federal government lacked, but that the states did have. Uh, that argument failed, but just barely. Five justices said Congress could do this, 
But one of those justices, Chief Justice John Roberts, said Congress could only do this uh, through its power to tax people. That it can say, you can, uh, what, what the, the Affordable Care Act did say, which was, if you don't have health insurance through one of these mechanisms, then you have to pay a certain tax. And Robert said that was a permissible use of the taxing power. But he joined the four dissenters who said, Congress cannot directly regulate uh, by making people have to buy uh, health insurance. So one question is now that um, the uh, one of the five justices, Justice Ginsburg, who thought the law was constitutional, is no longer on the court. If she's replaced by Justice Barrett, will you know one of the other justices who dissented uh, flip and say, "Well, I dissented, but I'm going to accept it as a fait accompli"? Will they adhere to it as a matter of precedent? Even if they don't. How will they decide the pending Supreme Court case, which poses the question whether the law is still valid in light of the fact that Congress in 2017 reduced the tax owed to zero? What the Republicans have argued and what the Fifth Circuit agreed with is that if the, the law, the mandate is only valid in virtue of the tax and now the tax is gone, the mandate is no longer valid. And if the mandate is no longer valid because the mandate was part of the whole uh, uh, architecture of the law, the whole law is invalid. Uh, in my view, that argument is bad in many respects, but I thought the argument against the validity of the ACA was bad in many respects, and it garnered four, depending on how you count, five votes. So it is quite possible that as you know, Joe Biden said yesterday, uh, the Supreme Court will throw out the entire Affordable Care Act. But just to turn to the policy implications of that, one consequence of doing that, I mean, one, one, the question is, what would Congress then do in response? One thing they might do is they might restore the tax, right? But Judge Barrett has said she thinks even the tax rationale is not good. And there might not be five votes to uphold it as a tax anymore. Congress could, in response to uh, a decision by this court that the existing Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional, say, well, all right, well, one thing you said certainly would be constitutional is government-provided health insurance. So one ironic result of a very aggressive Supreme Court striking down this kind of compromise could be to push Congress to enact more comprehensive health insurance that actually looks more like what you have in other countries. So that's an example. I think of a uh, policy implication of, of this process. Thank you. And sure. I think we have space for one more question, right? Anybody, don't be shy. I, I take a comment also. So, uh, I, I, go well, ahead. Tiffany was about to say something. Yeah, go ahead, Tiffany. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll go ahead and jump in and I'll just start with saying thank you so much for uh, your time and all of your perspectives and everything. I think it's been really insightful and interesting. And I've appreciated also sort of hearing um, even more about like the background of the Supreme Court formation and like thinking about how the founding fathers thought about it. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for that. And then I had a final question um, in our last few minutes. So thinking about just sort of, you know, from the public policy perspective, the Citizens United decision has sort of changed election financing um, in this country. And I was wondering if you have just sort of any thoughts about um, how that will continue to affect elections going forward. And if you think that this new Supreme Court um, may address or change it in any way. Yeah, so great question. Um, I want to push back a little bit on the premise. So I'm not a, I, I don't like the Citizens United decision, but I don't think it's, it marked much of a break with prior uh, decisional law. What, so just the, the deep background here is that in the wake of Watergate, Congress passed uh, campaign finance regulation. And the Supreme Court in a 1976 decision called Buckley against Vallejo upheld part of it, but struck down another part. And, and at, at the time, it did not divide the court on partisan grounds. Uh, but what the court said in Buckley against Vallejo was that all campaign finance regulation implicates freedom of speech because campaigns need money to reach the public. 
but that different kinds of limits are different. So that spending limits uh, are virtually per se unconstitutional because most of what campaigns spend money on is political advertising. So the court said you can't have any spending limits effectively. They didn't literally say that, but they came close to saying that. On the other hand, contribution limits, how much somebody can give to a campaign um, are permissible. Most, uh, so two, there've been two main developments since Buckley. One is that there, the, the line between campaign contributions, regulable campaign expenditures, not regulable, has been attacked from both directions. So progressives have said, you ought to be able to limit uh, expenditures too, because it's flooding the system, right? Uh, conservatives have said, no, you ought to eliminate the limits on uh, contributions too, because a contribution has an element of free speech as well. So nobody has been happy with the regime. Given the conservative drift of the court, I think if they abolish the line that Buckley drew, they're more likely to say no holds barred. So that's unfortunate. Uh, the second main development uh, has been that because the contribution limits are uh, relatively low, I mean, they're, they're high for a normal person, or you're allowed to give, uh, I think it's like close to $3,000 per candidate per primary and another 3,000 in the general election, and that's for every possible office, right? Um, so so that's, those, those are high limits for a person of normal means, but for a super rich person, they're low limits, right? The way super rich people uh, get around that is through something called independent expenditures. Uh, that's what Citizens United involved. The Citizens United, so, so Buckley itself said that, uh, the, that Congress can't limit independent expenditures. So if I'm a billionaire, and I want to put up billboards saying dump Trump uh, or, you know, make America great again or whatever it is, even though that's going to support one candidate or another, I have a right to do that, to spend unlimited funds of my own funds on the theory that that's not a contribution, that's spending and Congress can't regulate spending so long as it's independent. Now, as you can imagine, lawyers being lawyers and people who want to buy political influence being who they are, a lot of litigation and argument ensued over what counts as independent. And basically the trend since Buckley has been to allow more and more to be done through so-called independent expenditures. That's what, what, what Citizens United does is it opens that space up for corporations and unions. Uh, the union piece is important, but not as important as the corporate side. So uh, I, I guess my view is that at this point, it would probably take a constitutional amendment uh, to enable the kind of uh, campaign finance regulation that would be needed to really limit the, the, the effect of money on politics. There are creative ways around it, uh, but they tend not to be very popular. Right? One creative way around it is lots of public spending. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, it's easy for demagogues to say, oh, you want to spend billions on um, uh, politicians, but that's money that's going to be taken away from X, Y, or Z. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, hey. Yeah. Thank you, uh, the, Professor Dove. It's been an amazing time. And I'm sure this dialogue can continue because the subject matter is of a high public interest. But the judicial institution will remain an iconic institution and deliberations and concerns about it will continue to be a democratic matter. So we are excited that you have been able to preface this, our speakership series. And uh, we thank you for making our time to doing it in a rather remarkable way. I also want to thank all the attendees for making our time out of their difficult schedule to have one more Zoom type, you know, in an era like this. We cannot 
express ourselves fully enough in terms of the appreciations we have for you. Uh, let me also say that this would not have been possible without the synergy uh, that we harnessed at the Cornell Policy Review. The editorial board has been very fantastic under the leadership of Tiffany Egard. And I will allow her to close the session by maybe making one or two other remarks. Uh, otherwise, we're on top of the hour and uh, I wouldn't want to place more tax on your time. Thank you for coming and it's been my pleasure being part of it. Thank you, Cosmos, and thank you, Professor Dorf. We really appreciated your time and your intellect. Thanks. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, thanks, thanks to all of you for coming. Okay. Thank you. Right. Have a good one. Thank you. you too. Bye bye.